recap of the round four of the candidates. Um, extremely fun round. We have a clear leader after uh, round four, and that is Jan Nepomnishi with plus two, uh, followed <coughs> by second and third uh, uh, place um, between Gukish and Fabiano. Uh, what's important is Gukish already played with Nepo, but Fabi hasn't played him yet. So this is uh, pretty clear. Vidit uh, was the tragedy of the um, past few rounds because he managed to beat Nakamura. But then he lost two games in a row first to his, uh, his compatriots, to Prague. And yesterday he lost to Jan Nepo. Um, Alright, so let's do the recap of the games. So, um, Prague versus Naka. Um, you've seen my recaps before, then I predicted that this game would end in a draw, as both of them have lost their games before, and they needed to recover. Besides, Prague is playing black, which is fine. And, uh, you know, when you play d3 here, it's pretty fashionable actually, yeah? Um, black has a lot of choices here. Yeah, black can play b5 and play d6 instead of putting the bishop on c5, but bishop on c5 seems to be uh, the most aggressive choice. Uh, this way black sort of transposed the game into the mix of the Catalan. Uh, the only difference the bishop is on a4, not c4, and it's not clear where this inclusion of pawns on b5 um, is better for black. But it's 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 again it's it's a mix, but it's also archangel with a d3, which is not considered to be pretty dangerous for black. So h6, a4. The idea of a4 to force black to decide um, where to put this bishop. If they put the bishop on b7, which is not really great. Uh, place with the bishop now that the pawn center is fixed here. You can play b4, you can play rook b8. So playing rook b8 is uh, very flexible because the opening of the line by itself is not very scary. It's a long game ahead and um, black is always be, will be able to challenge uh, the file later in the middle game. And bishop e3, which is pretty innocuous. Um, after this move, uh, it became evident that uh, Hikaru wanted to play very safe, just make a draw and uh, leave himself some time to prepare for the uh, next games. Um, yeah, because if you want to play for win, it's not going to be very easy here. Might will have to go something like knight c3, d5, then c3, d4 anyway. And pretty sure that Prague is ready for that as well. Yeah. One of the other famous lines is uh, sometimes white takes on e5 and plays d4, but then you already play d3 here, so it doesn't really make sense. But then because you go into the line, tempo done. All right. The, the, the difference is that black plays h6, which is pretty useful move. Okay, so after the bishop trades, uh, d6. Black has cemented his pawn structure. The only uh, thing going for white potentially is this open file and the idea that you can put pressure if you double the rooks, put the knight on f5. Yeah, but it's not easy to do that because black is not gonna just stand and watch this. So queen one, reasonable. Again, the queen supports the knight, so knight can go to h5 and white doesn't have to worry about stuff like knight e4. Even though it's impossible right now, but still in the future it's possible. Also, the queen can go to g3. Um, and uh, white sort of leaves this knight to, to be developed either to c3 or d2. It's not yet clear where the knight goes. Uh, sometimes knight goes to d2 here to protect the bishop and uh, to protect the pawn and not to take the square away from the pawn so you can play c3, d4. But uh, knight c3 is also playable. Alright, so black castles finish the developments. h3. 
I'm not sure if h3 is necessary, but I guess uh, white wants to have an option of playing queen g3, queen h2, and push the pawns, or just king h2 and g4. So, the critical position is this, yeah, black needs to do something about this bishop. So one of the easiest things to do is just try to trade this guy. And the question is, do you want to trade him immediately by playing bishop e6 here, which is also absolutely possible. Um, but then white sort of gets the chance to play something like queen c3, and queen d7, rook a6, and get a tempo. Because if you play an d7, then white plays an d2 and manages to connect the rooks, and suddenly white controls this file. Now with a limited amount of pieces, it gives white certain activity, which is not what black wants. All right. So black plays knight e7 first, and the idea is also sometimes to play c5 with the threat to play c4, because if you if you trade on c4, white's um, double pawns become more pronouncedly weak, and in general this c5 c4 idea is always present in the structure that uh, the basic strategic threat that black has to uh, disconnect the central pawns for white and create three pawn islands two double pawns. In addition, the knight goes to g6, potentially, uh, to be able to trade this guy on h4. And again, most importantly, to play c5, connect the pawns. So white plays knight c3, and I think knight c3 is, um, is logical, but not the most accurate move. Knight d2 makes more sense, because if bishop e6, white has an option of actually holding on to this bishop and inviting black to capture first, so you recapture the knight. But yeah, it, it really doesn't matter at this point, um, because black plays bishop e6, and um, Naka plays knight d2, he doesn't want to take on e6, but um, the reason is that you can't really hold on to this uh, file. I mean, you can, but um, there is, uh, the, the knight is not here that well placed, yeah. So if you play something like queen a1, queen d7, queen e7, uh, again, ideas are b4, c4, undermining white center, rook a7 goes to rook b7, queen a5 runs into knight c6, it's not so simple for white to play, queen a2, and um, there's this very interesting maneuver to play knight to c7, where this knight will protect the pawns, and most importantly, cover the square, followed up, followed up uh, by the rook a8 and um, trading off this active rook. So, um, the problem for white is that his knights have no squares where he can try to, you know, uh, create pressure on the black position. Black is very, very solid, this pawn chain, uh, controls everything, knights have no squares, and knight c7, knight c6 covers, these knights will cover all these entry squares, so this a file becomes pretty useless. So, uh, that's why white doesn't play rook a6 in this position. But b4 was uh, pretty possible. Yeah, you stop kind of c5, and then you sort of look at this guy, fix him on the square, potentially rook a5, and potentially also queen can go to b3, and also d4. This move sort of leaves some game in, in the position, some fire in it. So if you wanted to play for some win, b4 would be the way to go, because at least some possibilities open. Um, what, what did he do in this position? He plays knight d2, queen d7, very reasonable, and white plays knight e2. Uh, basically just shuffling the pieces, potentially knight can go to here, also maybe prepares for d4, but after rook a8, uh, the position is just dead equal, so Naka takes, 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 and uh, knight g3, and knight g6, again, there's no play for either side, black actually takes over the file, but rook a8 back, and just draw, yeah. they repeat the position, because no side can make really progress, and black, um, you know, can't really make progress if you have the knight here, because knight has no future. If you wanted to play for a win with black, then you would play c5, and then you try to go for the c4 break, okay, or d5 at some point. But that, that will lead to a very double-edged uh, position, and Prague just wants to make a draw with black. 
All right, so very solid draw. I'm gonna leave this game for last because it's very important. So 5e versus Gukirsh, I think 5e missed another chance, just like he missed a chance against uh, Naka in the first round. That tells you that, you know, 5e has good prep, but his technique, his uh, practical um, force of playing the game is actually not as, not at its maximum, okay? Yeah, I'm not reading the text, guys. I'm not reading the chat because I'm doing this video for the YouTube. It's uh, the idea is to do the recap. And uh, I'll answer the questions um, uh, later, okay? So, bishop c5, we have an Italian. Viviano is great with Italian. Obviously, it's something that uh, Gukish had to prepare for. So, h3, pretty much uh, theory. Rook e8, black doesn't go into this bishop e6 stuff where you... Um, W pawns, he plays rook e8. Very, very safe. b4, bishop e6. Uh, not much white can do uh, because black wants to take on c4, maybe play d5 some point. So white takes on e6 first, plays queen c2. The idea of queen c2 is to overprotect the spawn and uh, make a step towards uh, connecting the rooks. So white's bishop can go. Potentially play b5 and then d4 or something. But most importantly, black plays d5, the spawn is protected and you can put the knight on b3. So it's a little bit, uh, the position is almost equal, but it's not exactly equal, which is why, you know, this. The, I, I hate these positions for both colors. Uh, because you need to be crawling at the tortoise level. Um, it requires a lot of patience. Yeah, I don't really like h5 because there is no threat for the bishop g5 at the moment. So knight e7, knight g6 immediately actually makes more sense. Plus, uh, potentially black might actually need this pawn formation instead of this pawn formation. Because with a pawn formation like this, you kind of need the bishop on a fate to protect your king. All right. Um, traditionally, black usually plays d5, b5 here, and then again, h6 is not really necessary. And also, black doesn't play rook e8 here. It's usually like queen d7, uh, then rook d8 and go for d5 here. But okay, uh, let's see. Knight f1, very reasonable. Now that you played h6, the knight has a clear destination. Uh, d5, very logical, knight g3. And Gukish played b5, I think it's a little bit too early, yeah? A little bit too early. Um, yeah. So, um, the knight obviously goes to f5, and then white creates this major threat of always uh, bishop h6, sack, and then followed by the queen infiltrating with huge mating threats. So this threat is always is present. The only question is, after queen d7, would this be so dangerous? Actually, white's advantage is getting larger getting larger, but yeah, again, thanks to the centralization, potentially queen d3. Why it doesn't have this? Because um, there's bishop f2 first. I think just uh, knight e7, yeah. yeah. It's still not that clear cut, but queen h6 runs into knight f5. The, this knight is key. White doesn't have knight h4 because bishop is here. Yeah? So what do you take with the knight? King here runs into queen g5, so king must play f8, the only move. And now white uh, has knight takes f7. And it's a huge mess, but apparently black is a little bit better after knight g6. Okay, because capture, capture, and white's attacking potential is, uh, is gone. Yeah, but it's like one of the things you really need to sort of calculate when you play this. Uh, because knight of 5 bishop h6 is a real threat. All right. So instead black plays b5 and uh, now he wants to prevent b5, but you know, white has a tempo, yeah. And now this the, this idea is very hard to stop actually. So take, take, knight e7, Gokish uh, feels the danger, he 
makes the best move, sacrifices the pawn, but eliminates a very dangerous knight and uh, white has advantage, again thanks to the extra pawn, but uh, black has some counterplays, strong bishop, some squares, the game became more simplified, easier to play. C5, uh, again, black is trying to just trade absolutely everything and get into the three versus four and game which is going to be drawn, right? So bishop f4, the computer suggests taking b5 first. Don't really think it matters, to be honest. Grab and now is the, um, is the key moment, one of the key moments, I guess. Um, yeah. So the obvious thing to do is to grab this with the rook, yeah? Seems pretty obvious. Then you capture this, take with the pawn. And uh, you cannot take this pawn because of bishop f2 tactics, yeah? Indirectly protected. So black can play queen d5 here. It's probably the best move, but then rook a5, queen d4. And queen trade. And despite, you know, the, the fact that this is double pawn, it's still extra. And still some problems for black. Because if you have some rooks, minor pieces, potentially white can play g4, h4, g5, even g6. It's still problems for black, okay? So, uh, five playing knight c6 is a little bit strange because I kind of like this knight in the center. He does a lot of things. Also prevents the oversimplification by trading heavy pieces. Okay, let's see, maybe he has some direct ID in mind. But if he takes this bishop and just, uh, he misses cb4, no, he doesn't miss it. He can't possibly miss it, but he missed queen d4. Queen d4, because if black takes the knight, then the presence of this bishop and this pressure on the pawn is going to be huge and white has, uh, has a big advantage actually, okay? So queen a7, queen a4, because if you play rook a8, there is b5 and... Uh, Bishop d2 or something, bishop e3, huge advantage. Yeah? Bishop and rook is stronger than the knight and rook, especially when you have a uh, pass ball. All right. But queen d4, great, great uh, response. Now this queen is like in a textbook, right, for the beginners. Queens are very powerful and they're most powerful in the center. This queen is hitting all these three pieces. And now white is having a choice, um, which minor piece to protect. This guy, um, or this guy, yeah. I mean, uh, play queen c1 and allow queen a7, or queen a4 and um, obviously black takes the bishop. So 5b plays queen c1, queen a7, rook a4, but black now has time to move away from the spin and create counter pressure on this guy. And now um, it is very difficult for white to win this position, especially after this move. Very precise defense by Kukish, actually impressive. And as you know, I'm a big fan of the queen and knight versus queen and bishop, uh, because knights are more maneuverable. He can uh, land on the light squares in addition to the dark squares. And uh, queen and knight can create a lot more mating uh, capabilities than queen and bishop. All right, so uh, this pawn is like targeted. It's very hard to win this guy without weakening the king or allowing some interference here. So it looks like a draw, but the grandmaster still try, of course. Fabius always tries, which is a great quality about him. Uh, even even though things look, look like very simple, drawish, he still looks for the chances. Uh, and uh, black goes rookie one. Uh, he prefers to go for the active defense. Again, more trades. The queen end games are notoriously difficult to win. If you guys don't know this, actually, queen, king, and gh pawn versus king and queen, two extra pawns they don't win. Okay. It's, it's ridiculous, but it's true. So the queen end games are like rook end games, very, very hard to win. There, there have been famous cases when the game ends in the queen's, game, uh, queen's end game and one side has extra pawn 
you know, there have been table bases, like which pawn is the hardest to fight, yeah? Rook pawn, knight pawn is considered to be the more, to give most chances to win for the side with the extra pawn. Yeah, and, and, and like queen end games, if people say rook end games are hard, queen end games are like way harder, okay? So g4, black just saves, uh, protects his king from all the checks. Yeah, that's the only thing he has to be watch out, yeah? Don't uh, get into the pawn end game where white can keep his extra pawn. But apart from that, you know, it's very difficult for King g8, uh, I guess Bukish feels safe and uh, just walks around. And h5 is um, a little bit dangerous, but at the same time, uh, like, you know, probably he didn't see how white can make progress anyway. So check, check, queen c1, very strong, because white takes on h5, two double pawns here, absolutely. Uh, this pawn advantage is absolutely annihilated. And uh, obviously, so any self-respecting grandmaster would not do that. After this trade, um, yeah, you cannot take with f pawn because you lose this guy and then it's dead draw. So grab, grab. And after this, it's just dead draw. So they still make some checks, but you know they both know this is draw. Yeah, fine, they're still trying. Nice. Yeah, but okay. No chance. Um, so that was this draw. Then we have this um, again, Queen's Endgame. The Queen Endgames are very rare. So we have in this round, we have actually two Endgames like that. Is the sign of this unusual character, this candidates. This candidates is like uh, uh, mega, mega rare and amazing regional stuff. Very unusual competition. Alright, names are with d6, but it's an illusion because then it runs into the structure which is um, more related to the Queen's Gambit accepted. Yeah? Oh yeah. And then we run into this, knight e4, and black plays bishop b7, forces all the trades, and the game becomes absolutely equal, especially after this. You cannot take on b5, you lose the exchange. So actually black position is slightly better because this bishop is already on the long diagonal. And um, I think white should just play bishop b2 here. He plays rook d1, a little bit incorrect, because now white, uh, now black can play knight g4 actually. And force some issue here, okay. It's still, it's still draw, but okay. Uh, instead of Rizal plays queen c5, he wants to transfer the queen to h5. Reasonable idea. Uh, and white goes for this. Queen h5, queen f5, 94, queen g5. Black's trying to create some pressure here. And knight c6. No weakening the, the pawn structure, just good old block, body block by Abasa. Yeah. So, uh, again, due to the limited uh, no, uh, number of material on boards, very almost symmetrical like pawn structure. This is very drawish, yeah, very, very drawish. Black is a little bit better though. A little bit better pieces, a little bit more aggressive. Bishop is a little bit better. Queen is a little bit more active. Potential aggression. Um, so it's a little bit better. So let's see, rook a6, first line. h4 also first line, otherwise white is obviously worse. Yeah, this knight c6, uh, the engine says it's the top line move. The other move is g3, but to play g3 is really to weaken the, the light squares. It's not fun, okay? So rook here, h4 is the only move, because um, if you allow the spin to, to keep, along with the queen hitting the mate, you lose the knight, yeah? So, queen h4. Um, Otherwise, you know, if queen g4, white just takes the spawn, but if you play queen h5, there is no threat on this mate, and white can um, push the knight and hit the bishop. So queen h4, but after queen b5, you take on a2, win a tempo. Uh, black has now extra pawn. Unfortunately for him, 
uh, there is no way for coin to retreat without uh, allowing the trade or hitting this guy okay and once the trade happens this is the draw because double pawns even if the pawns were not doubled it would be four versus three which is theoretical draw but since the pawns are doubled it's uh, just a draw so b8 Alisa tries his best queen f3 very logical and white just wants to trade pair of rooks and uh, but uh, Alisa will try to very hard to you know to make something out of nothing here but in order to do that you need first to double the spawn and then uh, break apart this fortress which is very hard task all right so let's see e4 don't really not a big fan of e4 but okay it's playable g5 now rook is potentially coming to g4 which is why i bought the place this and uh, yeah Grab, queen takes. Yeah, it's very interesting again. White utilizes the fact that these are double pawns. So king h6, back here. Queen f5 is impossible. Black is trying to play king g6, f5, and double the pawns again. And uh, queen goes back, king g6, okay. Finally f5. Grab, grab. Okay, black undouble his pawns, but the pawn connection now is destroyed and this is weak and again uh queen endgame the spawns on the same flank it's almost impossible to win this has to be a very slow game but black is gonna have the time big problem uh pushing his pawns without allowing a perpetual check and if you don't allow then you have to put your queen here but the queen here is very passive right so he has to play f4, g4, very logical. If you take with a pawn, then absolutely zero chances to win. Queen f4 is the only way. You know, trying to create a pass pawn far away from this guy, so you can try to trade this guy for this guy. But now we have the age of the checks. And it's very hard to run away from this stuff. Um, and again, this uh, defense. There is actually a pretty famous uh, position with the fortress where actually, you know, this pawn and rook without black pawns actually makes a draw versus black queen. Okay, that that's how how chess is um, extremely tough to 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 win. Okay. The, the amount of uh, overprotection that can is possible, the amount of solid um, play is, is amazing here. King g4, yeah, the computer likes f3, but f3 is a little bit, uh, yeah, f3 is a little bit uh, engine stuff, yeah. So just checks, check, and draw. All right, now we come to the critical game, uh, the only decisive game, which created a leader for the events and pushed with it back. And we have the Berlin. So first of all, Berlin, to play Berlin against Nepo is, uh, is pretty weird decision um, because, you know, Nepo played the match uh, with uh, Magnus, right? He played also match versus Dink. Obviously, Berlin is a big part of their repertoire of those players. Yeah. Also, Berlin is uh, was very popular, uh, and I think Nepo has just way too much experience in Berlin, more experience than Bidet. Um, Bidet wanted to play something solid, but uh, Berlin, you know, the the end game. And we're gonna go into this end game. This end game is 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 very complicated. There are a lot of analysis, but you also need to understand this. The structures you need to understand the nuances, and I think Nepal is just better at this um, than than Vidit. Um, and also, when Nepal plays knight c three, 
Black now has a choice. You can go bishop d7, which I think is good for black, but you really need to know everything there. Uh, the other choice is to play something safe like king e8 and h6 or h5 lines, which is more solid, a little bit more passive for black, but I think it's more solid, but there are also more analysis, yeah? So, and Vidi picks this fighting move, bishop d7. I mean, obviously, you know, this is the move that uh, Napo's team would analyze, like, for both colors, yeah? Very deeply. And um, that's what happened. Jan just out-prepared this guy, yeah? h3, I think is the main line, h6, and g4. Um, I don't really know the theory here, but I think we can trust Nepo on this. And uh, the thing is, he plays knight h2, which is really weird. Um, but this is the move that put Vidit. As you see, Vidit now has 1 hour and 54 minutes. And then he, after his next move, he has 1 hour 18 minutes. That means he spent half an hour, like 40 minutes almost, on deciding what to play here. One thing about this position is that I once tried to uh, develop my pieces without taking care of this D file first. And it worked in one game, but in one of my World Cups I got eliminated, it was in 2015 by the Armenian guy. And in this position, he that guy just played knight d5 and that was first engine line. And it was amazing because the game I played uh, in this line was like only once and he prepared for it and he caught me. Yeah. And this move utilizes the fact that white rook is not on the d file. You can play knight d5 and uh, hit this guy. Obviously, there is a lot of analysis, and uh, probably Vidit wasn't comfortable uh, here. But if you can put the knight on d5 in general, it's absolutely fantastic for black. Okay? Because knight here is much better than on g6 even. It can hit all these guys, it's very hard to get rid of this guy. And uh, he can go to b4, b6, you know, and also the whole thing about this knight is he, he frees up the space for the bishops. As you can see, the, the engine actually likes the black position now. And uh, I have no doubt that black is absolutely okay here. The only point to be sure is that if you play a 4, you must play a 5. Yeah? If you allow white to play a 5, then black runs into like problems. Which still is not so obvious okay yeah this is very tough you need to analyze it and you also need to know when to play f5 you need to know when to play f6 and when to just let white play f5 yeah there are like so many things or also when to play g6 or h5 yeah all these pawn structures they're all like huge huge nuances the idea of f5 is that obviously if you take like this and then you know black is just almost winning yeah these pawns are weak disconnected Huge square and a five for black pieces, and then disaster because this bishop is now a monster. Yeah, but if you take on f6, then knight takes, then we will run to this position. And this position is pretty common, but you know, black develops, starts to utilize pressure on the white king. This king is safe, and black is okay. But again, what this this endgame is actually, I think, is more complicated. I think this, this is the reason why the knight is here, to protect the pawn. And if you guys know the classics, uh, um, the classics is the game between um, Lasker and Capablanca, right? It was in the exchange Spanish and Lasker played the exchange Spanish and uh, in those times it was considered to be a really dead draw end game. But Lasker sh showed that this was de very deceptive because, um, you know, he played a 5 he weakened the c5 square, but later he, you know, managed to make a breakthrough and uh, he, he won a fantastic game. Yeah. So again, with the engines, it doesn't doesn't work these days. Yeah. The engines are very strong, but yeah, you need to you need to analyze this, and I'm pretty sure Vidit didn't analyze this particular position, and Jan did. So Vidit plays g5, and it does look like one of the main ideas on this line. You play g5, you want to put the bishop here, pawn here, king runs to b7, knight c6, and then, you know, good game for black. So it is possible. But f4, let's see, the time, one minute. After just one minute, Nepo plays this move. That shows you, you know, the extent of his prep. 
bishop e6, knight e4, another one minute. So this is all have been prepared. And uh, now we enter this very famous pawn structure. Um, the reason is that knight goes to f6, you need to stop h5, okay? You really need to stop h5 to fix this pawn as weakness. Uh, because, you know, when you have pair of bishops, you really need to open the position up. So the big question is, uh, can you play h5? And uh, the computer says you can. But you need to, to, to worry about this move. Which I think is still okay for black. Um, so let's see, h5. Yeah, because if you take here, you must take now with the... Uh, Oh, you can take with the knight, yeah, because if you take with the pawn, then b5, knight, d5, and it's very hard to get rid of this guy. And this pawn is not going to go in the queen by itself. I mean, this is very complicated. This is very complicated. I think, obviously, white is better, but uh, black has really good chances to draw this. Because it's very hard to move this pawn and get rid of this central knight. Um, but if you play knight g4, which is probably what Napo wanted to play, because if you take here, it's a problem, right? Check, king e8 runs into knight f6, or king g2. And then knight f6, rook d7. So you cannot really take this pawn. But if you cannot take this pawn, this pawn on the h file is better than on the g file. The reason being because rook, rook pawns are always um, easier to push and harder to hit for the defending side. All right? Yeah, the comp says king c8 and black is better, which is debatable. Yeah, I, I don't know. You need to you need to analyze this position because it seems like you know white pulls the knight on f6, controls all the squares taken from the rook, and then bishop g5, h4, and h5. Easy plan, yeah. But obviously things are not so simple. Obviously, because black plays knight f5, stops h4, potentially bishop e7, rook g8. Yeah. Also counterattacks uh, these guys. It's not so simple. Anyway, so I'm pretty sure h5 was analyzed. Vd plays b6, wants to protect this bishop first of all. But <coughs> knight f6, and now this pawn structure is fixed. Uh, as I mentioned uh, during uh, live uh, uh, viewing of this game, uh, one of the most famous examples of this uh, endgame is when black has bishop, two rooks versus the opposite color bishop, and two rooks with this pawn formation. There were some famous games by Swidler uh, where it was proven that this opposite color bishop endgame is actually um, very close to winning for white because after pushing the h pawn, creating this h uh, uh, passer, the endgame is extremely dangerous for black. Right. So, king c8 logical, uh, knight g6 to king c8 first, probably doesn't matter, king g2, king b7. Black rooks are connected, but now the problem is uh, what to do. Yeah, a5 is a little bit too slow. Is a little bit too slow. Black really needs to, you know, start creating threats, and um, yeah, the, the, he probably didn't want to decide where this knight goes to g6, d5, c6. I'm not gonna be able to cover like or explain all the nuances of the Berlin game because in one position, one idea looks good, but. With a little pawn move difference, suddenly it's completely a different story. Yeah, it's a lot about nuances here. You have to really um, study this stuff, and you you have to you know understand it, and you have to be on top of it. Like you have to practice it all the time. Because if you don't practice this, you don't play it a lot, then you lose this um, understanding of the nuances, and you forget. Yeah. So a5 is okay, but. Um, yeah, this a3 is uh, apparently not that great, but okay, Nepo played this after two minutes of thinking. Okay, so maybe he knew this idea. Yeah, a4 looks good, rook d1. But now, yeah, knight c6 is okay, absolutely. And, you know, b5, b4, just push this pawn and utilize this bishop, yeah? That's the idea. c3. Bishop e7 is probably unnecessary, yeah? So you see the computer agrees with me. Just play b5, h4, b4. And the idea is then uh, you put the rook, and once you take the pawn, the rook comes into play. Or you can actually take and play c4 and hit the pawn, because uh, it's not so easy, yeah? 
Um, for example, like if you play g5 here, yeah, well, I can just play h5 now, actually, and not worry about g6 stuff. Because this pawn is blocked here. You're not moving. You cannot sacrifice stuff. You need to play h5, and then you play g5, yeah? And now there is a lot of calculation here involved. Yeah, one of the things is that I said about rook here, but also knight can go to c4, which might be even better, because you might need the rook behind the pawn. Right? After you take the pawn, you need to actually push it. So the knight goes to c4, so g5. And uh, again, a lot of nuances, yeah? Do you play knight c4 or do you take on g5? Calculation, uh, I'll leave it to you guys. But this looks pretty, pretty what standard thing looks like, yeah? Because bishop is seven, I don't really understand this. Um, yeah, he probably thought that if white plays h4, he can take here, yeah? And play rook g8 or something. Yeah, and then, then, then black is okay, because uh, rooks are active. If you take with a piece, then you disconnect the pawns, then you attack this guy, and black is actually much better, yeah? So you guys see, like, one wrong move and one side is better. But unfortunately for him, he missed knight h4 here. Yeah, knight h4 is um, it's kind of a very, very strange move also, to be honest. Yeah, this is a pretty strange move, because I don't think knight f5 is a threat. Like, for example, if um, black plays b5, knight f5, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it's possible. But okay, I wanted to see what is this, yeah? Because you double the pawns, but now the rook potentially goes to d7. Also, this pawn is very dangerous. White can actually consider sacking the rook, uh, sacking the exchange here. The king can go to h4, rook goes to g7. Yeah, this, this is very dangerous for black. Because this double pawns is much better than this double pawns. And two rooks and a bishop is way stronger than the knight and two rooks, as mentioned many times. Yeah? Also, king can go to h5. This pawn is very weak. Yeah, this is pretty dangerous. Yeah, so knight f5 is actually a threat, you yeah? know, pretty good threat. So, uh, the only thing I don't understand is why h5 is so good here. Why is this move good? And if I take, oh, rook h5, rook g8, you win the piece, yeah? Okay, uh, and if I take, then you take on f6, rook h5, advantage black, if I play knight f5, then you take take and take on f5. And now, you know, you see the difference having these pawns or not, yeah? And now black is just winning. Because <laughs> there is no weakness and this rook just operates and hits everything. Wait, this is actually wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah, rook h5, rook g7 and white wins. Okay, yeah, <laughs> one move. One move difference. So rook here, check. Rook f2 and rook h5 now. You can then probably even play king c8, I think. Just take away the square. Yeah, it's advantage black for sure. Yeah, so h5 is very interesting. Um, and white must play g5 here, obviously. Yeah? But if you play g5, there is no more knight f5 idea, and you have to watch with g6. Yeah, and then bishop d8, knight d7, yeah. So this is complicated, and you need to know this. Uh, because is this better or is this better? Yeah, because g6, who knows? And we did, what did he do here? Um, oh, he did play h5, okay. g5. Oh, okay, he didn't see uh, bishop d8, I see, okay. He plays rook a5, he thinks g6 is not dangerous and yeah, but rook a5, when you disconnect your rooks like that and you send your rook to, towards this pawn grabbing adventure, when it will be actually like disconnected from the whole board for a few moves, it's a huge risk always, yeah? So I think this, this whole plan was the beginning of the, of the end, um, because black is absolutely fine here. Black is absolutely fine here, because you cannot play g6, okay? Like b5 g6 because grab grab and rook g8 okay white just loses this piece 
So there is no threat, despite you know Napo's prep. This position is so solid for Black that you know Vidic just thought about some moves. He played logical moves and his position is good, right? Yeah. So King H2 first, and um, but then you have this move because King doesn't protect this knight anymore, so you cannot take this pawn. And if you play G6, it's uh, grab, 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 yeah. Or, or you can take on G6, yeah. And it's equal. Eh, okay, equal like, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it's not human equal, okay? It's like so much play there. Anybody can make a mistake and anybody can lose. Both sides can lose. It's double-edged. That equal, okay? <laughs> so, rook A5. Um, rook E1, first line. The, the reason is that now in a lot of lines where black wants to take and take, this rook will hit the bishop. This bishop is the key to everything, to the universe. So, and after this move, you guys see it, right? After this move, black is just putting this rook out of the game. I'm pretty sure Nepo was very happy here. So he plays g6, the threat is to play g7, he must take, take. And he has only one move, and he didn't see it. H4 first to force White to you know get his active pieces out. Okay, but Rook D8 looks also good. Yeah, he's thinking like, what can possibly stop me from playing B4, hitting these guys, and with this Rook here, I'm hitting everything. I'm probably winning. Yeah, because White pawns are not going anywhere. Unfortunately for him, uh, White can just grab the pawn, and this knight goes to F4 hits this square, and most importantly, hits this bishop. And white gets an extra pawn. So, check. He gets the pawn back. But nobody is here to stop the pawn, yeah? The pawn can only be stopped now by king, bishop, and knight. Versus bishop, rook, king, knight, yeah? White has extra rook here to push this guy. Black is, like, outnumbered. B5 is the only way. Bishop G5, yeah. Knight here. Vidit plays. You know, he is a great player. Yeah, he finds the best moves, but unfortunately for him, it's not enough. Uh, rook D1. Apparently, Rook E5 was better with the idea of Knight F4, but that would probably transpose the game into the. Um, um, oh, King E4 here. Okay. So, C6. Okay, C6. And then it'll most likely end up with the um, something like this, yeah. Which is a draw, of course. And rook b3. Yeah, this is gonna be a draw because you know black's gonna trade all the pawns, rook versus rook and bishop. So that's why Napo plays rook d1. And the idea is if you play c6 here, then there is knight f6. And the rook hits this guy. So you must play like um, yeah, knight of six, knight of six. Oh, rook d7. Oh, sorry. Critical, critical move. Winning move. Yeah, this is a winning move. And um, ah, but then you you have this idea. And if this pawn falls, white can put the bishop on d4, protect all these guys, and uh, then you win the bishop here, and it's absolutely winning. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, end game is extremely. He plays end games extremely well. This is one of his bread and butter um, things. Like people think of Napo as like this dynamic player, huge preparation, yeah, but very dynamic attacking player. But they don't understand that this guy is also like a genius in the end games. Yeah, the only reason he lost to Magnus in those end games is because he got into this crazy queen versus rook and knight and uh, pawn, yeah, or two pawns. And that endgame was actually a draw, but it was uh, only the engine could hold us against Magnus Carlsen. Yeah, Magnus is like also a genius. Um, so bishop e8. Oh, and, and, and he made this. Uh, this is the losing move, yeah? Apparently bishop e8 was the move that um, kept the draw chances. Yeah, because you, don't, you, you can't do this trick anymore. Um, and a bishop knight here and bishop here. And then you take this pawn. Take, take, take. 
Oh, you cannot take this. Yeah, there is this rook g2. So white doesn't have time. You must play this. Yeah, this looks actually winning for white, yeah? But rook e2. Looks winning, but the problem is after you take this pawn, this bishop has no good places to go. Black wins um, two minor pieces for the rook, which is a draw. So knight d8, king b6 is a draw. King f5 is the only way to play for a win. And yeah, this is uh, complicated. Anyway, um, yeah, this is the moment, but he had only six minutes left and you need to calculate really well here. So what happened, he plays king c6 and it's a critical mistake, he misses king e4 completely. Yeah, this is the mistake. He sh what he should have done here, is he, he must take this pawn and play this endgame, which still gives him some chances, okay? This he must do. Yeah, still some chances, okay? But he plays bishop e8 and he blunders the rook d5 and after this he's completely lost. Because he missed this move. Now all these pawns are protected, the bishop is under attack and you cannot save the bishop because rook goes here, king goes f6, rook h8 and white promotes clear queen. You cannot give up the bishop for this pawn. There is no time. I mean, you need the bishop on c6, but the king takes the square, which is why king c6 was so bad. You need the bishop here. But now the bishop is under attack, you don't have time. So he tries to make the time. Um, but the only way to do that would be to play something like this. But white can now actually just grab the bishop because everything is protected. And the end game is just to win, yeah. Also, king of six is a threat still, so you cannot get the bishop to c6 anyway. Yeah, so this is a win. Yeah, this, this, this is amazing uh, calculation by Napo, to be honest. Yeah, just clean pawn promotion. Black cannot give up the bishop. Um, grab, grab. Bishop d7. King of seven. Yeah, the only trick was that if you take here. And then rook b8, yeah, you stop the pawn, which is why you play king of seven first. Black must take, and black resigns because he must take, but then you grab this and the queen goes. Black rook f here, white can just play here actually, yeah, no, no check, nothing. Yeah, this was, so this was a great game by both. Uh, Vita did amazingly well, uh, despite facing this prep, uh, he got a good position. But then he ran into this rook b3 adventure, which he should not have done yet. Just b5, b4 immediately. Uh, because as you can see, the rook here is what caused his loss, yeah? Rook did not manage to stop the spawn in time, and the spawn just promoted. And also he had some chances at the end, but he kind of probably got upset and uh, his morale went down. And when that happens, your quality of the game, your trust in your intellectual process um, starts to get shaken and you make mistakes yeah mistakes follow each other yeah there's a chain so that's what happened and uh, what can I say chess is the battle somebody wins and somebody loses sometimes yeah in this case we have a clear clear leader Jan Nepo demonstrates once again why he won two candidates before uh, he didn't play many tournaments, he didn't win anything in the last year, but he saved all his energy, saved all his prep for this absolutely critical one event. Why? Because he wins this event, he goes to the World Chess Championship match, and there is a million bucks there, man. You know, in the tournaments, you, you're not going to win anywhere close to this mountain, plus, of course, the prestige. All right. Still, the tournament is not over, okay? It's just four rounds left, but we do now have a clear picture, pretty much, who is struggling, who is not. Um, there was a very curious situation in the COVID uh, years of the candidates. If you guys remember the story, the candidates started and then the COVID happened. And then there was this whole, whole saga about, you know, what to do. And they actually postponed. One half of the tournament was played and the other half of the tournament was postponed until next year. 
It was ridiculous. The most ridiculous situation ever. It's uh, never happened uh, before that and probably the only time that we, we, it happened. Well, it's not going to happen in the future. That was the most ridiculous stuff. That's where uh, Nepo actually benefited the most because uh, I think after the first round at the time, um, he was not the clear winner, you know? All right, but let's let's take a look. So Napo is in a good form, Gukish is in a good form, Fabi is in a good form, but he is not in the best form, okay? But still, you you get the form during the tournament. So Fabi still uh, has good chances. Prague lost the game, which is huge, yeah? You lose one game, your chances go way down. But he's 50%, he is still potentially there. All it takes is to win two games and you catch up to the winner, yeah? Um, Naka really lacking good preparation, minus one, just playing solid games. Playing solid games is okay in the Blitz, but in the candidates, nope, not enough. Uh, Abbasov, the newcomer, he is, he is being shown what the, what is like playing with the big boys, yeah. Alariza, uh, good, good prep, not bad gameplay, but very, uh, strange practical decisions like taking risk causing his this loss yeah he wanted to win but instead you lose the game and you're at the bottom Vidit actually won the game was a briefly leader but then he lost two in a row uh, this tells you that uh, these guys you know again the experience factor the experience factor of um, playing in this tournament is they both lack it yeah yeah and uh, it's one thing to plan it, it's also another thing to win that or to be in the top spots. Yeah? Naka still has that experience. Last time he came close to, to qualifying for the match. So I wouldn't take Naka completely off. Now that people think that he's, you know, he's not going to be a competitor, that's where he is going to try to grab you. Yeah? So, so I would say that these guys, they all still have chance because um, you know, amazingly enough, the difference between the top place, first place, which is plus two, and one of the top places, which is plus one, and the bottom place is only minus one, yeah? It takes only two wins, and the whole situation changes drastically, yeah? We have 10 rounds ahead, and a lot of things can happen, so let's see who is going to be playing tomorrow. Tomorrow we have Prague versus Nepal. Uh, if Prague wants to, you know, stake his claim, he needs to, to win tomorrow. It's still the first, uh, the first um, stage, right? Uh, Alariza versus Nakamura. This is going to be a big fight. Uh, they're both not doing well. It's also a chance for, for them to get back to the 50% and get those theoretical chances back uh, to compete for the tournament. Gukish playing White versus Abbasov. Huge chance for Gukish, and he's playing white, uh, but he has to, you know, remember that, you know, Abbasov is still a pretty damn strong player and not to take too much risk, yeah? Uh, but he, he can win this. If he wins this game, he will be among the leaders, which will be extremely unusual for the first time comer, like Gukish, but, you know, it will be a great thing. Vidit playing White versus Fabiano is uh, is very hard to predict. Um, this is like a dark horse of this round. Anything goes. If Vidit demonstrates great prep, he can win this. If Fabi demonstrates his prep and capitalizes on Vidit's uh, current, you know, weaknesses. And uh, his, his team and he is very strong and very good at um, identifying those weaknesses in the current state of his opponent. And he'll try to capitalize on that. Um, he's got the experience also, yeah. So I would say that that experience gives Fabi a sort of an advantage. Um, if they play for a win, if they both play for a win, then Fabi has advantage. Um, if it is just plays for advantage, but also keeps the game within you know, solid parameters, then it's going to be a draw. So either black wins or it's a draw. Uh, this game, I think either white wins or black wins, actually. Okay? I don't think it's going to be a draw. 
Uh, this game is definitely, I think, is going to be a result. Because draw is not good for either one of them. All right. But a, a win is good for one, but the loss is just going to completely knock out the loser out, out of the tournament's uh, race, pretty much. All right. So, Prague versus Nepo, pff, probably a draw. This is the result. This is probably a result, and this is also probably a result. So, tomorrow is going to be an exciting round, yeah? Exciting round. Uh, the race is not over. Tomorrow is actually a huge day. And I'll see you guys after tomorrow. All right. Hope you enjoyed the recap.